I'm Dr. Elizabeth Burberry, an associate professor at the University of Waterloo in Applied Health Sciences. And today I want to talk to you about creative representations for knowledge mobilization. There are three key points I want to talk about. What is representation? What can creative representation look like? And what should we consider when constructing them? For the past 12 years, I have taught qualitative methodology and social theory in both the US and Canada. I absolutely love teaching various ways of conducting qualitative research because thoughtful social inquiry done with people, not on people, can inspire us all to see and act differently in the world as we transform it for the better. One way we can think about encouraging change in our world is through the ways in which we choose to represent or show to the world what it is we have produced from our research endeavors. We should ask ourselves, how do we show the world what it is we want them to understand, critique, or deconstruct through our research? Who do we want our messages to reach, and how do we want people to access them? How do we want our work to make people feel, think, remember, or question? In other words, when thinking about representation, we are asking ourselves, how do we want our research to work in the world? In answering these questions, we begin to think about the various ways research can be represented to people. Through journal articles, presentations, policy reports, or classroom lectures. But how about also through theater, documentary, art exhibits, comics, or even slam poetry? In this video, I'll be talking about choices we make regarding how to represent our data with specific focus on doing representation differently by opening up traditional representations to also use creative practices, making our inquiry both accessible and exciting to academic and non-academic audiences alike. So what do I mean by data representation? Representation, or how we tell or show an audience those messages which we want them to take away from our work, is both explicitly and implicitly connected to seven other points of consideration in what I like to call a scaffolding for humanist qualitative inquiry. While not all researchers will follow this same eight-point scaffolding, most will at least attend to aspects of it. So let's take a quick look at where representation fits into the research process. The full qualitative process can be a cyclical scaffolding that considers philosophies of being and knowing, called ontology and epistemology, and those ideas through which we think about how the world works, called theoretical frames. These three concepts taken together will inform our representation because they provide notions on how things exist, how knowledge might be produced, and how knowledge connects to what has already been thought. When representing our data, we also must consider our methodology, such as grounded theory, ethnography, or narrative inquiry. In other words, the plan of action that provides us with a framework around how to proceed through our study. Methodology helps us to think about what questions to ask, how to ask them, who to ask them of, and how to choose which methods are most useful to generate the kinds of data that we need. After situating ourselves among these four interconnected points, ontology, epistemology, theory, and methodology, we then reach decisions about method, such as interviews, participant observation, artifact collection, or in other words, the procedures we use to generate data. As we generate that data, we also simultaneously begin to analyze it or make sense of it through our own experiences, the theories we're thinking with, and the connections and juxtapositions across data. Once we begin to make sense, it becomes time to represent the sense we've made. Now we've reached representation, or how we choose to tell or show our research to intended audiences through knowledge mobilization. At this point, it should become clear that while representat representation seems to take place after analysis, we have actually been working towards it from the start. Our choice of representation is always already connected to all other points, each being reflected through one another in a congruous symphony. 
Even after we construct our representations, they must continue to reflect and be reflected in the final points of conclusion, connecting back to our philosophies and our theoretical frames to help answer the so what of our research. And this so what often relies on representations themselves, since representations will help to determine who has access to our work, where it can make a difference, and how it might be mobilized to create change. And it is this idea of continuity across these points, or perhaps my own feeling of incongruency among my own research's eight points of scaffolding, that led me to wanting to do representation differently for my dissertation work, an ethnography of a sorority. I remember the moment 11 years ago now, where I was sitting at my dining room table trying to take all the data I had generated through numerous life story interviews, participant observations, and artifact collections, and fit them into discrete agreed upon categories and themes. All the messy data sat in front of me, transcribed and disjointed, as I tried to make sense of it, keeping in mind my research questions, experiences, and post-structural theories that I was thinking with. I began my formal analysis and representation as I had been taught in books and classes. And so, I focused on codes, categories, and themes, and then represented one theme at a time with my interpretations and data quotes as evidence. And at that point, that is what my representation looked like. Decontextualized themes, researcher interpretation, and data evidence. And that's what I did. Until I couldn't until it just didn't make sense with my philosophies, my theoretical frames, and the ways I was making sense of the data in my head. Until I felt how incongruous it would be for me to take this complex data and my post-structural thinking and try to simplify and decontextualize it, all for traditional analysis and representation. Now, there are times when this form of representation is the most useful. And to be honest, it is the norm when doing basic qualitative inquiry. People take large amounts of data and work to find agreed upon concepts that show the majority experience expressed within. The data is taken out of context in order to highlight the most meaningful, quick to the point ideas that will drive home that which the researcher feels is important to share. These traditional analyses are often presented in charts and outlines, with final representations, again, providing that main theme supported by data quotes that give evidence to the researcher interpretation. But what about other instances where reducing data to majority themes works to silence underrepresented voices or decontextualizes experiences in ways that render them less meaningful? As I sat there staring at my traditional representation, I began to feel overwhelmed. Could I take all these messy, complex, in-depth in experiences of sorority women and reduce them into themes when there was so much more to show? How could I keep my representation better aligned with my philosophies and theoretical frames? Could I consider leaving tradition behind and using creative representations such as screenplay, poetry, or comic, all genres that would allow me to show what I felt needed to be shown? And this is when I turned to creative representations, or creative analytic practices, as Laurel Richardson would call them. In my dissertation work, I thought about how I had come to know about sorority women. It was always movies, Legally Blonde, Revenge of the Nerds. And while I didn't want to support these popular caricatures of sororities, could I maybe still use screenplay to show the complexity of my data? And that was my first venture into creative representations. I began with ethno screenplay. And since then, I've also used composite narratives, visual poetry, slam poetry, quiz format, and comics. Let's take a look at a few examples. And please note that these representations encourage complexity of the data because they don't divide ideas into categories but rather represent multiple ideas, juxtaposed experiences, and even researcher voice within a single representation. And remember, these all aligned with my scaffolding, much of which have been grounded in post-structural notions of language. So let's look at three examples. The first example is the ethno screenplay I created for my dissertation work. 
I created settings, characters, and dialogue directly from interviews, observations, and artifact collections. Characters were created as composites of five to seven key informants, as seen in characters where the description is shown in different colors. Each color represents a different participant's contribution to that character. Each one of these characters was specifically designed to show the diversity of my participants. Twelve scenes were also constructed to engage multiple themes, ideas, and contradictions with special focus placed on gender due to my research questions and theoretical frames. As you can see in the slide, rather than one theme, represented by a color, being discussed at a time as in traditional representations, various themes were discussed simultaneously and overlapping. Following each scene was also director's comments, where I spoke about my subjectivities and thoughts in connection to theory only after the readers had come to their own conclusions about my work. The second example I did with Dr. Corey Johnson using data from his study on drag. Similar to the ethno screenplay, this visual poem uses composite ideas from across multiple participant in-depth interviews about drag king experiences. It was specifically constructed to highlight some of the shared and juxtaposed messages in the data around gender identity within drag. There are four poems to this series, which colors, space, font, and size are used to help highlight different aspects of the poem and draw attention from the reader. This last example is from my most recent project that I collaborated on with Coco Guzman, a talented illustrator and artist. After conducting life story interviews with nine cisgender, bisexual, or pansexual identified women, we analyzed data using narrative analysis to construct one composite character who would take the reader through many of the shared experiences of participants around bisexual identity, erasure, and need for community transformation. Coco and I worked together to create the character, stories, and setting from data, which Coco then illustrated into a comic. Although I could have done the illustrations myself, this was a clear moment in which eliciting the help of artists made the work that much more meaningful and respectful of the genre, as you can see from a comparison to Coco's beautiful work for our published comic. I invite you to consider exploring your own use of creative representations for knowledge mobilization, if they make sense for your research. With that in mind, I'll leave you with some tips to consider along your journey. If you decide to do something creative because it aligns with your scaffolding, think hard about your genre, why it's the best fit, and how you might use it. Explore exemplars of artistic expressions to get a better idea of what you'd like to imitate or not. Ask for help. Connect with local artists, students, and even participants to help co-construct your representation. Seek the knowledge and creativity of others. Be aware of style, structure, and purpose throughout. Don't just plop data into creative formats and trust that it's meaningful. Do the hard work of creativity. Remember that creative analytic practices have their own forms of evaluation and should always be scrutinized using Richardson's criteria. Consider if your work makes a contribution to the literature, has aesthetic merit, is reflexive in its construction, has emotional impact, and expresses a reality. Finally, does using creative representation help your research to do the work you want it to do? Never choose creativity just to look innovative or to jump on a fad. Only do it because it makes sense for the change you hope to see in the world. I hope that this video has piqued your interest in appreciating and using creative representations in qualitative inquiry for knowledge mobilization. Remember, as Richardson reminded us, creative arts is one lens through which to view the world. Science is often seen as another. We can see better with two lenses, and we might even, at times, see best with both lenses focused and magnified. At the end of this video, you'll find references for further reading. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Burberry. Thanks for watching.